Hello, my name is uh, Jay Chauhan. I'm a mentor at the Angel Mentorship Group, where we support young lawyers launching their practices. If they like to join and ask any questions and join the meetings, we support the, the young lawyers who are trying to launch their own practices because it is very challenging in the way the educational system is organized to try to make the sessions when you first start your legal practice. Uh, we've launched about 20 lawyers and about five paralegals in our group so far. I've done a number of CPD lectures as well. And uh, today's topic is on the question of uh, shareholders agreement. So to explain the shareholders agreement, I just want to go back a, a little to explain the role of the shareholders agreement in the context of the Ontario corporations as well as the federal corporations. So the first uh, uh, question I want to address is that at the, in the Constitution Act, the, the jurisdiction for corporate uh, law was permitted to both the jurisdiction, both federal as well as on each province. And I'm in the province of Ontario and uh, I practice a number of years here, and I want to talk about predominantly the Ontario law, but a lot of the principles of the law in terms of the Business Corporations Act, both federally and provincially in Ontario, have a lot of similarities in them. So there are, uh, there are a number of examples uh, for the similarities, including how the bylaws are drafted, how the minute books are kept, and how the jurisdiction essentially works between the, the two jurisdictions. So as far as the Ontario Business Corporations Act is concerned, that act is designed for the corporations with share capital. It also applies, the, 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 there is another statute for the incorporations of charities, which works very differently. I won't deal with it today, but I will deal with the essential difference uh, that is there. And the reason I'm not dealing with the question of the charities today is that the charitable corporations have members and the corporations with share capital have shareholders. So it is when you have the shareholders, you have the problem of uh, essentially providing of how the shareholders will react to each other. So going back to the Business Corporations Act, I just want to point out that the act essentially deals with the question of the, the rights and duties and obligations of the directors and shareholders in the statute. For example, if you have 51% shares, then you can more or less elect the board of directors. If you have uh, the shareholders, they have a right to the financial statement and the annual return and uh, that particularly is required in the annual meeting. And if you're a director, you can issue shares and you can also um, issue new shares or transfer shares between one director or another director and, and make provisions of what you can do with respect to shares in each company if you're a director. So the right to make disposition of the shares is in the hand of the, the directors. But uh, apart from defining the roles of the directors and shareholders and the bylaws in terms of how the corporation is governed, there is um, not a specific uh, arrangement in the, in the Business Corporations Act for the purpose of uh, essentially determining how the shareholders will react with each other should there be disagreement. And that disagreement and the possibility for many organizations is fairly high because one person works uh, hard, feels that uh, he deserves more. And when they can start a company, there is a lot of enthusiasm, but this enthusiasm then fades when the company either succeeds or does not succeed. And then one person feels that uh, they're not making decisions properly. And therefore they now need to get out of the company and the, and the arrangement of how they can get out of the company without winding it up uh, is the arena of what is uh, 
done in the shareholders agreement. So I will review the shareholders agreement from that point of view. So essentially the shareholders agreement is an arrangement between the shareholders by way of a contract. And the contract essentially talks about a number of key issues that are relevant for the parties to understand and keep in mind in the event that there is a disagreement or a person dies or you need to issue new shares in the company. So first of all, the most important provision of the shareholders agreement is a question of buy sell arrangement. The, if a person is dissatisfied with the way the company is running, then a number of things you can do. For example, you can change the directors if you control 51% of the shares, but the person that you dislodge in the company as a director in a meeting will not be very happy, if, especially if there's a dispute. So what can you do? So some of the instruments through which you can control the disputes and the, the arrangement between the shareholders is by such agreement. And especially if the agreement is the unanimous shareholders agreement, then it can also overcome the bylaws of the corporation. So the Business Corporations Act, as I mentioned earlier, deals with the question of the, the election of the directors with 51% shares in the, in the common shares, which permits you to elect the directors. And they are the people who are able to to issue the shares, transfer the shares, et cetera. So the power to, to make disposition of the shares is in the hand of the directors. But that structure of the, of the Business Corporations Act as to who can elect the directors and what the directors can do is in the Corporations Act. But how do you resolve the dispute is not in the Act. So therefore you do need a shareholders agreement. And then if you can make it a shareholders agreement which is unanimous, then you can more or less control the relationship between the parties and can also overcome the bylaws that you might have had pursuant to the, the statute. So how does it work? So I just wanna go through the most common scenario in smaller companies in terms of what happens when you have a dispute in a smaller company. So the first question is that uh, a person feels that uh, his shares need to be either bought out or sold out. So you can, if you didn't have the shareholders agreement, which is very common by the way, then you can wind up the company. But what happens when you wind up the company is that you're in court waiting for the court to decide that the company will be wound up and the assets will be shared between the shareholders after you pay out the liabilities. So in the time that you're waiting for the decision to be made, that the issues are already being uh, determined by the shareholders in the daily business of the corporation. So if you're such as, if you're a, a restaurant, for example, you can't wait for the judgment to come and uh, the shareholders to continue the business because there's a lot of tension at the time. I have gone through one of these examples right in Richmond Hill. And uh, I mean, briefly narrate actually how it plays out but essentially what the shareholders agreement is designed to do is to find the resolution of the matter before the court comes into picture and winds up the company and makes a distribution of the assets to the shareholders. So coming back to the arrangement, the most important section of a shareholders agreement is the question of the buying and the selling of the shares buying and selling of the shares. If you decide that you want to get out of the company, you can initiate the sale process by creating a purchase price for the shares. So let's take an example that you have 50 shares and the other partner has also has 50 shares. So you decide the value of the company. Suppose there's a restaurant worth about half a million dollars and you feel that after the, the liabilities are taken out, then the value is about 400,000 approximately. I'm just taking an example. So therefore your shares are worth $200,000. So you take a value of $200,000 and initiate the process of the termination of 
the agreement or arrangement between the two shareholders to terminate the arrangement of working together in the company. So you make an offer and initiate the offer to say that, look, uh, shareholder, the other shareholder, would you like to buy out my shares at 200,000? So this is all done in writing. And you give 30 days to the other person and say that, yes, either he will buy it out or he'll be required to sell out. This is an agreement made between the shareholders beforehand. And therefore, for the recipient of the offer, it is important that he makes the decision within a time frame. And he says either, yes, I'll buy you out. No, I will not buy you out, but I'll sell you out. So either buy out or sell out is essentially the requirement of the agreement made between the buyer and the seller. And the initiator of the offer is required to make the determination of the value of the shares. And therefore, you're stuck with that offer. If you quote too high a value, then you would be basically be waiting for the other person to, to sell out the shares because he doesn't want to buy the shares at high value. If you to quote too low, then the other partner might say, yes, it's a good price and I'll buy you out. So that keeps the initiator in line with respect to how you basically behave in terms of initiating the process of buying and selling. So once you make the offer that is made in writing and the provisions of how you make an offer, the wording, et cetera, are all given out with the address and so on in the shareholders agreement, and you make that uh, move and the recipient of the offer then makes a decision that he will buy or sell. So once you made the decisions, it's required to, to sell out the shares or buy out the shares, and then you have a closing, at which time the two lawyers who are independent will then come into play with respect to the carrying out of the transaction, which will be, suppose that the recipient of the offer decided to buy you out, then he would prepare a resolution and say, that uh, 50 shares uh, which were owned by the initiator would be sold for a value of $200,000. And then the buyer will say that I will buy it. And these are the terms of the purchase. And then the purchase transaction is then uh, recorded in the, in the minutes. And then you are uh, paid the money. And then the other person acquires the money removes you as a director, and you continue be, to be the sole owner as a recipient of the original offer that was made to buy or sell to you. So this is called a shotgun arrangement. And the reason why the shotgun arrangement is made is that it forces the other person to buy or sell, and that's done by a, con a contract. So the arrangement for the parties to do this thing by contract predetermines the manner in which the offer will be made, the decision to be made by the recipient and the obligation to carry out the arrangements. Should he not do it, and that happens as well, then you have to make a provision in the shareholders agreement that in the event that the other person fails, then you may buy him out and then acquire the whole corporation. And if he still does not cooperate with you, then you can put the money into a bank account or someplace where you can if you go to court, then you can uh, argue that you've done your part pursuant to the agreement, and then the rest is litigated to determine that the arrangement that you had agreed to was carried out by you was correctly done, and therefore you've done your duty, and therefore entitled to the ownership, ownership of the shares and control of the company. Then you can start preparing the resolutions, notice to the ministry, and then uh, carry out the function of the operations of the business and move forwards in terms of the business arrangement. So I think from this example I illustrated, I had a real experience at Richmond Hill in which this did happen. And if the other lawyer is not very familiar, it's important to recognize that uh, sometimes what happens is the lawyers are getting instruction from the client. The clients may not be aware that the intricacy of how the buy sell agreement may work. And therefore, they may not give the proper instructions to the lawyer uh, who may 
basically not react correctly, or the other person is too stubborn and will be basically be saying that, look, uh, you can make the offer, I don't believe in the paperwork, I'll appoint a litigation lawyer. And that's actually what happened in the situation. And he appointed, instead of trying to do the corporate work and uh, carry out the, or the organization of the company first and the shareholders agreement next, and then make a buy sell arrangement, if it's not agreed outside of the court, then it can end up in litigation as it happened in this situation. So I think there were three sets of lawyers on the other side in the situation that each one, the first one being the corporate law, he advised the client, but the client didn't want to listen to the advice and say, no, I just want to go to court. So sometimes the parties who are not familiar in the corporate law make decisions assuming that the court will make decisions based on simply what is right and wrong or just or unjust. And the reliance on the court system is very heavy because they assume that the lawyers are simply doing what they should be doing based on the, the instructions of the client. So this is one of the problems that we have to deal with in a smaller companies, <clears throat> but where the company is large, then there is much more sophistication in terms of their experience, the knowledge of the law and how to use the legal system to understand and make decisions when the offer is made and the offer is received by the, the other party. So in my year, many decades of experience, what I've seen that if you have an agreement, the chances are fairly good that the agreement is an incentive to the shareholders to reach an amicable resolution. So although I showed the mechanics of the resolution to you in the description of how it works, it is more likely that once you have an agreement signed by the parties, they, they think it out in their minds that there is a method of solving the problem and they're more likely to find a resolution without going through the formalities, the offer and acceptance, et cetera. So I think that is a great advantage, but very often the level of corporate understanding with an average and smaller time client is very small. So I just want to describe to you where the Ontario community, community is in terms of understanding a typical buy sell agreement or a shareholders agreement. So many have figured out that uh, you can go directly onto the website and uh, do an incorporation online. So even accountants begin to figure this out. And uh, in, in my observation, they're much more, uh, you know, outreaching to the share clients and more ready to do it than the lawyers. And the lawyers are waiting for the clients to come to them. So they very often complete the incorporation but very often the organization of the company and the, and the shareholders agreement are never mentioned by them because they're not the experts and they're supposed to be a lawyer's job, but very often the articles of incorporation is done by them. And so when it com the problem comes to you, you are then burdened with the decision as to how to react. Are you going to suggest at that time as a lawyer to your client that you want to organize the corporate uh, stuff or are you going to wait for something drastically going wrong and therefore you will try to make decisions in, in a state of emergency or in a state of uh, conflict. And I had this happen very recently to another client where because the documents are not prepared uh, fully then the parties then end up uh, calling the police because they say, well, I am uh, uh, being torn out from the office and I have a warehouse and I'm being taken out of the place and I want to complain and that you have to, the police then end up trying to make decisions who should stand and stay in the office and they do not, the police do not want to necessarily make the decisions in terms of the rights and obligations of the parties. And I think it is their duty to simply keep the peace but not try to make a decision on the ownership, shareholders agreement, et cetera, because these are complex issues that a typical um, policeman is not used to the idea. But very often in the mind of the client, he, the policeman becomes the first person to complain too. So it's very important that uh, when you have the opportunity as a lawyer or a paralegal to, to talk to your client, that you properly advise the client the necessity of having a proper uh, minute book, 
the organization of the shareholdings and the number of shares that each person has, the place where you can send a notice to the, to the directors or shareholders, have a proper notice to the ministry, keep a record there, and then do the documentation, keep it ready so that if the event of a conflict happens, you have a ready solution to deal with the situation. So uh, I explained to you actually the first provision of the shareholders agreement in a conflict situation where you buy or are compelled to sell the shares. And, uh, but there are other situations that you ought to be aware of, such as, for example, uh, a new offer of the shares from the corporation to new shareholders. Now, in an existing company, you still have to worry about the situation because the corporate law, the Business Corporations Act does not restrict the issue of the new shares uh, unless you put it in the Articles of Incorporation. So you have to look at the Articles of Incorporation and determine that uh, there is a, a requirement that if the new shares of the company are uh, basically created, it can upset the balance of power, if you like, of the directors to be directors and carry out their mandate as directors for each year after they're elected. So the way the new subscription of share happens is when the, when the shares are issued, and suppose if they should 50-50 each for two shareholders, you can have a situation where the director calls a meeting and says to the other shareholder that I'm having a meeting, the other person doesn't show up, and you make the decision when there's no shareholders, shareholders, shareholders agreement to issue another 10 shares. So now you have a few more shares, which is a total of 100 plus another 10, 110, but the new 10 shares are issued in the name of the first person who was initiating the meeting of the shareholders and saying that I would be, or directors and saying I'll be issuing the new 10 new shares. Now, to prevent that happening, you have to make a clause in the shareholders agreement that says that the new shares will not be offered to strangers until these shares are first offered to existing shareholders. So if you have two shareholders, for example, and then you issue two, two new shares to, for the purpose of uh, raising some capital, then uh, it should be first offered to each of the two shareholders. So for example, when a company with 100 shares, 10 new shares are offered, then five would be offered to the first shareholder, another five to the second shareholder, and if both agree, then now each person have again 55 shares each. And you raise some capital, additional capital required in the corporation by issuing the five new shares based on the value of the company and the shares at that time. So this provision of the new shares to be issued is also um, put down in the shareholders agreement. How does it work? It requires you to make what is called subscription of the shares for the offer that is made by the company and then to the shareholders and say that we need to raise some capital. Now there's the capital of the company can be raised by different types of shares. Common shares are normally those where you write to vote. So if you have a preferred share, for example, also now current uh, statute calls it the special shares with the designations and preferences attached to them, you would first offer to the existing shareholders, these new preferred shares also, in which event the right to vote does not exist. And therefore, the, the, unless you define it, that they would also have right to, to basically vote. But if you, if you issue the shares, you have to make a decision that in a small company, firstly, you're concerned about the new shares and new capital that is coming to, into the company and, and the, what the value will be. And then the offer to the shareholders will be made in proportion of the shares at that time owned by that company. Now this law applies also when you have three shareholders or 10 shareholders. So when you are uh, dealing with two shareholders, which is easier to understand, 
then you explain the situation where you are offering five shares, new shares to the shareholder, and therefore you have a new uh, share structure in which 55 are owned by the first shareholder and 55 by the other shareholder. So whenever you have equal number, the problem of the deadlock continues. If you want capital and there is no dispute in the company, then the offering of the new shares does not create a problem. But if you have a dispute and the other person tries to use that ability to issue new shares to change the balance of power in the company by issuing more shares in his own name, then you do have a problem, which you want to prevent by using a clause in the, in the paragraph that deals with the new, up, new arrangement to subscribe for new shares by indicating that the first offer would be made to the existing shareholders. Now, sometimes the, the different shareholders may or may not have the same financial ability, and therefore one might say, yes, I can subscribe, another one might say, I cannot subscribe, and therefore the per person who cannot subscribe to new shares may see that uh, the balance of power and the position of the parties will change. So if you had a shareholders agreement which in which the rights and, and, and obligations of the share shareholders are defined, then you would be in a position to make a discussion before you exercise those rights. So the purpose of the agreement and the shareholders agreement is to ensure that there is a discussion and an, an amicable resolution of the matter before you exercise the right. In my experience, if you simply write the clause in there, it will be an incentive for the shareholders to discuss the matter before you exercise the rights in writing. So just because you write it in there does not mean that you have to follow what you'd say in the writing if you can find an, a resolution that's agreeable to both the parties. So now I discussed with you the buy sell arrangement, subscription for shares for the new shares to be issued. I also like to point out that uh, life is uncertain and you could have a third situation, namely a shareholder dies. So what happens when that happens? The shareholders who are also in a small company, directors of the company, managing the company on a daily basis are uh, very often knowledgeable in that particular trade and have the skill to run the business and therefore uh, they are competent to carry out the mandate of the company and make a profit and the family or the two families that are partners continue and they support their families from the income they generate from the, from the corporation. But as it is, it can be uncertain that a person is going to live or not live, have a car accident or is old and dies, then what happens? So in that situation, the, the arrangement is made in the agreement that the survivor of the, the shareholders will buy out the deceased shareholder. If you have more than one or two people, then you would then allow the surviving directors or shareholders to buy out the shares of the shareholders in the proportion in which the survivors own their shares. In different words, for example, if one person has 30% shares, another person 70, and then, and then some shares became from the third shareholder freed up to, to be bought out because he died, then the 70-30 ratio is maintained in the way you offer the shares for purchase to the existing shareholders. The purpose of this exercise is to ensure that the balance of the power and authority and the hierarchy that you created in the corporation continues in the way that uh, the company existed. Because sometimes there is a shareholder who is more knowledgeable, who is leading the company, he is able to raise the funds, and therefore you've given more shares to him. And that balance of the power of the directors should not be interrupted or disrupted even in the, in the event of a person who dies in the company. So the person dies and this usually accidental, not fully uh, anticipated. So you need a mechanism to determine the value of the shares at the time that the person was uh, deceased and what the value might be that the others might have to pay. Now, let's take a simple example of the two shareholders and, and you've asked in the agreement that the surviving shareholder will buy out the shares of the deceased shareholder. So what happens is that 
the value of the share cannot be determined once he's died. And the interest of the buyer essentially is to buy at the lowest possible price and uh, to not have a dispute with the executor of the estate of the deceased and the surviving shareholder, you need to have some kind of understanding as to how the value of the shares be determined. So one of the mechanics that is popular and, and used in the shareholders agreements is that you evaluate the value of the shares of the company for each year along with your shareholders meeting and that time you allocate the value to each share and multiply by the number of shares that you have is the value of the shares that you own in a company. So that value uh, is designated and confirmed by the, sh the, the shareholders in the annual general meeting and that value will apply for the year following. So each year as the company grows and improves the value, you have a situation where you improve the value of the company and divided by the number of shares is the value per share of the, per, the, the shares that, that may be bought out by other shareholders in the event of the death of that particular person. So that value applies to everybody who's got the, uh, the common shares. Now, if it's preferred shares, this does not apply because the preferred shares redemption value is set out right in the beginning in the Articles of Incorporation. So uh, those shares would have to be bought by the other you know, person buying, or if the company buys its own shares, then you simply extinguish the shares after the companies purchase them. But all that should be written out in the shareholders agreement. But normally you'll see that the shareholders, shareholders agreement does not talk about the preferred shares. It talks about the common shares, which has the effect of uh, relationship between the shareholders in terms of who will buy out the shares and who will sell out the shares. And one of these events that I'm talking about is essentially what happens when a shareholder dies. And I think so I described to you the predetermination of the value of the shares based on what happens uh, in an event of a shareholder dying. So these three events that I mentioned in this uh, discussion applies to a shareholders agreement. And, and, and therefore you have covered most of the typical situations that can arise in the event of a death, disagreement or issue of the new shares. So these are critical um, agreements. So you'll see that these agreements can be worded in a very complex wording. The concepts are somewhat complex and makes it difficult for uh, explanation from, from the lawyer to the shareholder. And so the way that you can do it as a lawyer to the client is to prepare a draft agreement, call it a draft agreement, let the accountant see it, let the shareholder see it, and then you designate the time when everybody signs. So it's very important actually that at that time, you also recognize that the interest of the shareholders is different um, between the shareholders and the company. The company is a separate entity. And uh, if you have shareholders who are not in agreement or may have a different point of view, you want to cover yourself for the independent legal advice, which is very fundamental in the common law jurisdictions. And how does it work in a company situation? So this is uh, true of all the situations where the lawyer is acting for the corporation. So you should be very vigilant as to the role that you assume in drafting the shareholders agreement. So I think what my solution is that you act for the company, give a notice to all the shareholders and they indicate to them that they have a right to appoint their own independent legal counsel. And, uh, and, and once you've done that, you fulfill your duty. And I think that you remind them again when they come to sign the agreement in your office and say that, okay, is there any disagreement between the parties in terms of understanding, in terms of asserting the legal rights as between the shareholders, et cetera. If there is any disagreement of any kind, the safer thing is for you to then tell the clients that they should have independent counsel. So you might have in a big company, each shareholder having their own lawyer and one lawyer acting for the company, all of them agree on the shareholders agreement and then you sign it. So once it is signed, that you now have a framework which will help the company survive even in the event of a dispute or a person dying. 
But I want to go back uh, to the last uh, matter that I discussed, namely the event of the death of a shareholder. So in the Ontario, there is the Family Law Act, which now requires the quality of the division of the value of any asset that is owned by the by the husband and the wife to be divided pursuant to the requirement of the net family property uh, that is a part of the, the current Family Law Act. So how does it work? The way it works is that you have uh, a person, for example, dying, and those shares are now in the will of the deceased going to the, to the executor first, and then from the executor under the will to the beneficiary. So the executor is a person that you deal with as a lawyer when the time comes to deal with the shares of the deceased, when suddenly a shareholder dies and you have a, a, an agreement to carry out. So what can you say in the agreement to indicate that now what would you do in the event that the spouse says that I want to get my share? So you can provide usually a, a kind of an arrangement in which the survivor is required in the agreement and obligated to buy out the shares of the deceased so that that uh, the wife of the deceased does not come in the company and start making decisions. Actually, that's very important because most of the time wives are not necessarily involved. And if it is women involved in the company, and then the husband is not involved, the same principle applies. So those who are knowledgeable on the way the company runs is very important to know, understand, and then maintain in the in the arrangement that you make in the shareholders agreement as to who should be there at the time to replace the person who died as a shareholder. So typically, I think that uh, a clause that you write in there would say that the survivor will buy out the shares of the deceased and then he, that cash goes to the state of the deceased and becomes a part of the state of the deceased and then they deal with the cash, meaning the wife can deal with the cash. And then you deal with the question of uh, you as a lawyer of the corporation, I mean, will deal with the question of what to do. Now you have to keep in mind that most companies in the smaller companies, they're not dealing with large companies in suburbs and, and uh, in, a, in a smaller arena, you know, uh, in terms of the client that we get. So what we have to do is to suggest to the client that an arrangement for the payment be made by installments from the earnings of the company over a time period with the right of lien to be put on the asset of the company until the full amount has been paid. So if the buy sell exercise for the event of the death of a shareholder comes into play, then you would then be writing a clause to make sure that there is an arrangement either through insurance or a staggered payment so that the payment arrangement succeeds. Because if you have an obligation to pay half the value of the company to the survivor, then you have a problem because usually companies don't carry that value of half the value of the total assets in cash ready to give to the state of the deceased should that event happen. So the insurance is a very good mechanism and the insurance companies have all forgot specialists. So what happens very often is that if you have a situation where the client agrees to insure the, the value of the shares, then there is the insurance that you can buy in the name of a company that insures the lives of the directors, which are critical. The critical life insurance in a corporation is a, a known concept in the insurance arrangement. So you need a, an insurance agent that is able to understand this concept and know how to deal with it. But usually a, a corporation's <coughs> expenses for the purpose of insurance are deductible from the taxes for as an expense of the corporation. So once you have talked to the clients and they found an agent who is able to understand this and provide for the insurance arrangement, then you have an arrangement to deal with the issue of where the funds come from in the event of the death of one of the shareholders. Now, I think when the company is starting, it is usually not very possible for the people to have enough money for insurance. The insurance payments are, uh, can be hefty and depends on the age of the critical directors. If the directors are young people, 
then Chan's value will be reasonably small. If they're older, then it's fairly high. So therefore, when you are advising on a shareholders agreement, it is very important and critical that you get the insurance arrangement or the staggered payment arrangement worked out between the parties, depending on, depending on the age of the shareholders that you're dealing with. So all these principles that I mentioned to you are dealing with uh, two shareholders, but the principles also apply when there are more than two shareholders. You know, in a smaller company, for example, if you have three shareholders or 10 shareholders, the principle is the same. But let me just explain actually that I want to go back to the first option that I explained, namely the bicep arrangement, if it is done between more than two persons, how would it work? So here's a scenario. Let's take three, for example. You have three directors and three shareholders who have equal interest in the company through the shareholdings, and the directors have a disagreement and they want to buy and sell the shares. But very often you'll see that the third person is the one that both the other people have difficulty with. So it's one person that you want to get rid of in the company and the other two want to stay in the company. So what you can do is to set the stage in the wording of the shareholders agreement that the two may buy out the interest of the third person in the same manner as two would do, one for to the other. So two people find it easier for them to buy out the one and the one that is the sole person that left out may have a right to buy out the two, but financially it'd be very difficult for him to buy out the two shareholders because the amount of money required, if they're one third share owners each, it'd be much more than, than the person who is buying out one person share. So 33%, for example, of one shareholder is what is what is needed to be to be paid by the two shareholders is against one person trying to pay 66% and two thirds for the other two shareholders. So this is an example of the complicated language you might go through. So in the complications of the language that the law is right, you'll see there are two types of uh, arrangements that the lawyers agree on. They will take a very fancy looking wording with the complex arrangements of what I described. So the concept that I described can be put in either a simple uh, seven to 10 page agreement or can be very complex 20 page agreement. My own preference is that the agreement that you create should have wording that is reasonably capable of being understood by your clients. If you create a, a big agreement with complicated words and arrangements, um, then I think the clients would have difficulty following it. And therefore they end up going to the lawyer, the lawyers who are not practicing corporate law would have difficulty trying to interpret the agreement. And, and now the corporate law has become a specialty in Ontario and therefore you end up going to a lawyer and to interpret the complicated words. So my general principle in the, in the business law is that you do not need to write out the complex detailed language unless it is absolutely necessary. So the, to illustrate your verbal skills is not an important event when it comes to making sure that your clients understand what essentially you're trying to say in that agreement. So not only should you draft it and let all the shareholders look at it, but it's very important that you're able to explain the principles that I'd explained in this meeting to the clients and, and let them understand it. And that understanding will be the key to prevent the problem from happening. That's what you're trying to do in a company. And that's very fundamental in my view. So I think that brings up another question actually that is related to the question of the shareholders agreement, which is an estate planning problem. So usually the partners in a company are friends and they're doing business together. It may be the principal business They go every single day in the company and they're talking to each other and they're good friends or become friends or known to each other. And then the question does arise actually that if a person dies, they have their own insurance, their own family, and how do they deal with the survivor if a person dies, for example? So I think I mentioned the insurance arrangement, but I would suggest that if you have the uh, a situation where you advise in the client 
it is important to point out to them that the the advice on a shareholders agreement also relates that is connected with the advice to the shareholders in respect to the state planning of their family estates as well. So I think you do you have to get a specialist again in the in the issues of the planning uh, wills and plan in estates uh, law. I think some degree of knowledge is important because these are related issues. For example, if a person dies and the survivor gets the money, the insurance arrangement uh, should be understood by the lawyer sufficiently to advise on the ratio. The estate planning issue should be sufficiently understood by the lawyer, even in corporate law, to make sure that you have sufficient uh, um, understanding in your own mind, and then the understanding is passed on to the shareholders uh, enough to explain to them that they ought to look at the estate planning issues, such as, for example, if they have their own insurance unrelated to the company insurance, is that sufficient for them? Are they relying on the assets of the company for the wife to carry on the family? Does she have her own profession and an and ability to make income in the event the husband died and there is less or there was no insurance for the company and no money for the company to give it to the survivor? So what would happen to the company? What would happen to the family that where the husband has died? So the state planning concepts that we, we have in Ontario, uh, all should be reasonably understood, even if you're not a specialist, in terms of how you deal with the state planning issues. But one of the basic basic things you can do is to ensure that if you write a clause in the shareholders agreement to the effect that the you have insurance, then you have a value at which is paid by the insurance company to the company to be given to the to the deceased family as an executrix of the state, and they find that money is sufficient in their own estate planning to, to support the children, if any, or the wife to carry on the lifestyle that existed prior to the demise of the shareholder. So I think that it is very important to deal with that question and not omit that because you're a specialist in the corporate law. And some understanding of the estate issues is very helpful in this regard. And, uh, and I think in terms of the, in each of these lectures, I'm making sure that, that the Bard mission notes that you read are very inadequate in terms of explaining how to solve the problems as you deal with it. As you can see in this uh, lecture that you have to get enough information how to deal with the wording of the agreement, how to get the ILA, and how to make decisions and what decision for the future you make and how they're affecting your advice to the client are all very important because if you didn't provide for the uh, uh, proper advice at that time, then you could have a situation where it can be a liability for the lawyer because they failed to advise. But I think, are you required? You see, my experience in, in the corporate law is are you required to give all the variables you can rise? The, the chances are that it's not going to happen up to that level. And, but if you're a good lawyer and you want a good uh, advice to be given to the clients, then you should be talking about those subjects and be knowledgeable. But the way the bar mission, I read the bar material before I did this talk, and I saw that the way the bar material is written out is insufficient to help you make the decisions for negligence issues, for the knowledge issues to make decisions with. And the Business Corporations Act description, for example, will tell you the corporate law in terms of the sections and provisions, but the problem solving arena of what to deal with conflict and how to resolve it, and, and what is the practical experience that you have of how to get the two parties to sit together or write a notice that I'm buying on the shares is not fully and adequately displaying the bar mission notes. So those who are uh, students, I like them to understand that these lectures are designed for young lawyers and also the people who are trying to launch the practices. So it was a, a good session. I hope that was useful for the corporate law on the shareholders agreement. And we hope to continue these sessions every Wednesday if you want to be a member of the Angel Mentorship Group, you're welcome. And I appreciate Bahman.
and are done attending this meeting and we'll upload this in our YouTube and social media very shortly. So thank you very much, Jay. Thank, thank you, Bahman. Thank you for too being much, too much information in one session. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>